welcome back to computer science theory. Uh, this is comms three two six one. Summer B 2021 at Columbia University. And this is lecture three, part one. Today we're going to be talking about um, closure of the regular languages. under regular operations. And we're also gonna be introducing regular expressions, probably in the latter two parts of this video. So those are our two topics. Uh, if you're watching this on the week of July 5th, I hope you guys had a great holiday weekend. I'm recording this just before the 4th of July. Um, so hopefully you were able to get out, get some sunshine, have some fun, and you are recharged and ready to talk about TCS and languages again. Um, so in particular, the things we're going to be doing today, both closure of the regular languages under regular operations and regular expressions, um, which will turn out to be other ways of writing regular languages will massively increase our repertoire of ways to prove that languages are regular. That is, ways to prove that they can be represented, uh, recognized by some DFA or some NFA. Some quick announcements. Um, homework one was due or is due, depending on when you're watching this on Tuesday, July 5th at 11.59 p.m. EST. That's the unusual deadline because the, oh, sorry, July 6th should be a Tuesday. That's the unusual deadline. Usually homeworks will be due on a Monday, but Monday is off. And then homework two, which will be a short homework because we only have one class this week. This class will be due on 7-12-21. That should be a Monday. Also at 11-59 EST. So those are the homeworks coming up. The readings corresponding to today's lecture are Sipser, the end of part 1.2. So That'll cover closure of regular languages under regular operations and 1.3, which is the subsection introducing and talking about regular expressions. So let's see, what are we gonna do today? Um, well, we'll start with the review. I'll go very quickly through what we did last week in case your brain is emptied out over the weekend. I hope it has, because that would mean you're properly rested. Uh, we will show regular languages closed under these three regular operations, union, concatenation, star. We'll take a break. We will introduce regular expressions. this alternative way for um, writing something down that captures all the strings in a language. This is not a computational model. This is just a, um, a way of generating all the strings in a language. It's one way to think about it. And then finally, we will talk about, we will show that regular languages, sorry, we will show that regular expressions describe regular languages. And we'll do that by, um, we'll have a generic definition for a regular expression. We'll have a, in particular, it'll be the sort of generic definition that'll let us build up regular expressions from small pieces. And then we'll show how to systematically construct an NFA 
that recognizes the same language as the expression evaluates to, also by building up from small pieces. That's how this proof will go. And then I don't think we'll get here today, um, but either today or next class will show that regular languages can all be described by regular expressions. And in total, these two statements, four and five, will show that regular expressions describe precisely the languages that are regular. These two classes are equivalent and also obviously equivalent with the languages that are recognized by DFAs and NFAs. So in particular, we'll see that a different way of defining languages also captures the same class of languages that we've seen before. And that should kind of inform our intuition that this is a natural class. Um, we start to get the sense really that the concepts captured in this class are in some way similar to each other in difficulty. And this is the sort of intuition you get more and get more and more as you do complexity, as you do theoretical computer science, you start getting the sense that I draw the same circle around the same set of problems over and over and over. I wonder if these problems all have something in common. I wonder if fundamentally they are alike. And then, you know, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out precisely why they're alike or why they're different. Sometimes things surprise you. Uh, and this kind of question is the kind of question which people who study this find interesting. Um, if you're in the class today, hopefully I will have a Zoom poll. I might even have a Kahoot or something like that because I hear it's what the Gen Zs find interesting. Um, clearly, if you're watching remotely, I can't get you to answer a poll unless it was like Google Form or something. Um, but I do want you to take a moment right now and think, okay, how much bandwidth do I have for this lecture? What's the best way for me to digest it? And, you know, if you're feeling great, take it all in in stride. If you're feeling not so great, give yourself some space to breathe. Take it piece by piece. Um, and try to keep this high level framework in mind as you absorb these concepts. So you know when you come out of it, what you should have, um, what you should have in place, what concepts should be familiar. Okay. Our review of what we did last week. Um, we said, we learned that computer science theory or TCS, as I sometimes write it, is basically doing formal science on computation. We invent mathematical or formal models, we reason about those models, and then we hope that the conclusions we get to tell us something about our fundamental, about the way our world actually works, about the phenomenon of computation. Um, like, remember our proof Cantor's proof that the real numbers cannot be enumerated. That was a limit on what computers could do, proved mathematically. We define languages, which are sets of strings. And we said that you could often think of them as mathematical concepts. Like the set of all things that have this property represented in this way. We introduced automata. In particular, these are math machines. They read strings and accept or reject. And we call this recognizing a language. We say that a particular automaton recognizes the language of all strings that it accepts on a certain alphabet. Uh, in particular, our types of automata, we had discrete finite automata. They were the ones where whenever you're in a state and you read in a symbol, there is exactly one place you go from there. And NFAs, which had this power of branching or non-deterministically guessing. So sometimes from a state, you go to two different states. And sometimes from a state, your branch dies and you go nowhere at all. And of course, if any one of your branches accepts, 
after you've read every symbol on the input string, then the whole NFA accepts. Um, we said regular languages were those recognized by DFAs. And we showed this was also true for NFAs, that they had the same power to recognize languages. And how we structured our proofs We proved several interesting statements, and they all had this kind of constructive flavor to their proofs. Um, we want to show, we kept wanting to show um, if this object exists, or these objects exist, then that object. exists. So, for example, we showed that if A is a regular language and B is a regular language, then A union B is regular, which we constructed. We did a constructive proof. We said, hey, imagine we have A and we have B and we have DFAs that recognize A and B. We showed how you could create a DFA that recognized A union B. And similarly, we proved uh, that if a language was recognized by an NFA, it was also recognized by a DFA. We did this by saying, suppose I have the NFA, I'm going to show how to use its pieces to build the DFA that recognizes the same things. So this proof structure has been the main proof structure we've been relying on so far. Um, so that's a, a lightning summary of what we've done over the first week of the course. Uh, and then finally, I want to mention something we talked about last week. Um, that we're going to talk about more now. We define things called regular operations on languages. We had a union B, which is just all strings in A and B, A concatenated with B, which is all strings X, Y, such that X is in A, Y is in B. So drawing a string from each language and squishing them together. I could probably make my set notation a little bit more formal there. And we had Claney star, which I will write out in full because some people asked questions about it last lecture, and I think it's the least intuitive of these. Um, Claney star is a unary operator. It's an operator that acts on one language, and it creates the language of all strings of all strings that are created by picking some number of strings from A and concatenating them. So for any K greater than or equal to zero, we can pick K strings out, concatenate them, and put them in the language. This also includes the empty string, which is the K equals zero case. We define these regular operations. We proved that the regular languages were closed under union by this constructive proof above. And then we hit a roadblock when we tried to prove that the regular languages were closed under concatenation. In particular, it seems like a DFA that recognizes the regular language, that recognizes um, A concatenated with B, should figure out how to break this string XY into two pieces and guess where X ends and Y begins. And then, of course, we can run our two machines on X and on Y and confirm. But that guess was tricky to do with just DFAs. We're going to show that you can prove the closure of regular languages under concatenation in Claney star, and actually union two, using NFAs, and that the proofs are much easier. Doesn't mean you couldn't prove it with DFAs, but it's certainly going to take less complicated constructions. That's our first mission here for today. First mission proving this theorem, so you got two. Closure of regular languages under 
regular operations. Um, we want to prove, well, let's do concatenation because that's the one that stumped us. So the class of regular languages is closed under concatenation. Um, and remember when I write closed or closure, this is not the same closure as finding out why your ex-girlfriend dumped you. It's the closure that means if I have a set of languages and I apply the operation to um, some elements of the set, the result I get is still in the set. So this is equivalent to proving, equivalent to proving if A regular and A is a language, B regular, then A concatenated with B is also a regular language. And the idea behind this proof, it's going to use non-deterministic guessing. The idea is to build an NFA that recognizes A concat B by non-deterministically guessing when to stop reading a string from A and start reading a string from B. Okay? And I think you're going to like this proof because it's basically a proof by picture. So suppose we suppose we have two regular languages. A and B recognized by the NFAs N sub A and N sub B. This assumption is without loss of generality because we know that every regular language is recognized by some NFA. We'll build a new NFA N that recognizes A concatenated with B. So let me just draw N A and B for us here. I'm drawing two boxes. In one box, I'm going to draw an A, and in the second box, I'm going to draw an B. We want to use these two boxes to make a new NFA that will recognize A concatenated with B. So let's see. An A has some start state. It's going to have some intermediate states. And then at the end of an A, it'll have one or more accept states. So this is just a, you know, there's no specific computation going on here. I'm just drawing a picture of a generic NFA in my box. Similarly, NB, some start state, some intermediate state, and, you know, some set of accept states with edges going in or out. 
And my goal, of course, is to build an NFA that accepts some string, x, except a string x, y, such that x is in the language A and y is in the language B. Um, so we'll do this as follows. We create n by first um, including n a and n b entirely. So I'm going to include all the states and transitions from n a and n b in my new NFA. Two, I'm going to let the start state of n be the start state of n a. So I've got my new start state. And three, I'm going to give each accept state in an A, an epsilon arrow to the start state of NB and turn accept states of NA into ordinary states. So let's do that. Gonna create some epsilon arrows. Epsilon, epsilon, epsilon from my accept states of NA to my start state of NB. And then I'm gonna, oops, I don't wanna erase that much. Need a smaller eraser. There we go. Now my ending states of NA are no longer accept states. Um, and after I make these three changes, I'm going to say this whole thing is my new NFA N. And this is still an NFA, right? I've taken you know, a bunch of states, some accept states, um, edges, there's a start state, there's some epsilon edges. And I claim that n accepts a string w if and only if w equals xy for some x in a, y in b. And you may be able to see kind of why this works by looking at it. But at least for this first proof, I'm going to actually prove this claim in a little more detail. Um, like if I prove the only if direction, uh, suppose w equals xy for some x in a, y in b. And now I imagine I read this string in to my new NFA N. Well, in this case, we know on input x, y, some branch of computation reaches an accept state of an A after reading in X, right? This is by the definition of NA. Um, when I read in the string X, because the string X is in the language A, we know that at the point where I finished it, you know, at least one branch is in a state that was formerly an accept state of NA. That branch then takes the epsilon edge That branch then um, 
takes the epsilon transition to the start of NB, which accepts on Y, also by definition, right? To run the string Y through NB, um, Y is in the language B. So some branch of computation, now that we've gotten from um, first part of our NFA to the second part, will finish. So we've proven that if we put some string in the concatenated language into this NFA, the NFA accepts. The other thing to prove is that if the NFA accepts some string, it actually is in this concatenated language. And I've been writing, I've filled up my tablet screen completely so we can keep having the picture as a visual aid. But at this point, I do have to scroll down a little bit. Um, so we do the forward direction and we suppose N accepts some string W. Then there exists some branch that reaches an accept state. And by our definition of NFA computation, there must be some sequence of states that that string passed through. So we'll let, we'll let R1, R2, dot, 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 R, uh, call it NB, dot, 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 RM be the sequence of states that track our accepting branch and let NB, sorry, let R sub NB denote the start state of NB. So why can I make these assumptions? Well, we know that if N accepts the string, we must go from the start state of our NFA to some end state on some branch of computation. We're just gonna consider that branch and consider all the states it passes through. Um, it should be pretty clear that to get from the start state, beginning of NA, to one of the accept states, which used to be an NB, we have to go through the start state of NB. So it's without loss of generality to assume that the start state of NB is somewhere in our sequence of states. Uh, even if it is, you know, perhaps one of two states in this sequence, it's certainly in the sequence. Um, then we know that R1 through Rnb minus one correspond to a branch that reaches an accept state of Na and R sub NB through RM correspond to an accepting sequence in NB. And this implies what we wanted to prove, right? We now have a sequence of states that track a computational path through NA and another path through NB. Um, uh, by the definition of NFA computation, those two sequences mean that we've accepted uh, whatever string of symbols they correspond to. So that means W must be composed of a string uh, in the language A concatenated with a string in the language B. So 
that completes our proof. And I'll scroll up for a second in case you want to look at this diagram again. The proof is a little wordy because we went through it in detail, but the essence of the proof is really this picture. We've taken our two NFAs and we've smooshed them together to create a new NFA that accepts a string from A concatenated with a string from B, exactly. The string from A gets us through the first automaton and the string from B gets us through the second. If we get from the beginning to the end, we must have passed through um, states corresponding to a string from A and then a string from B. So we do in fact now have our theorem. The class of regular languages is closed under concatenation. And an S there. So well done. Um, with NFAs, we can prove closure using just a picture. And to show you how easy this picture is, I'm going to draw a couple more pictures, do a couple more proofs. For instance, this theorem that we've already proved. Regular languages, say, the class of regular languages is closed under union. And again, it's a proof by picture. It's a very similar sort of proof to the proof we just did. We say, given NFAs, NA and NB that recognize languages A and B following NFA N recognizes A union B. What's N? Well, draw N A up here, its start state. Some intermediate states and some accept states. And I'll draw NB down here. And I want to invite you at this moment, if you're watching online, to pause the video and think about how we could combine these NFAs to make an NFA that recognizes A union B and reprove this theorem. So pause now and think about how you might do some sort of a trick, perhaps involving epsilon edges. You got it? Okay. I'll draw this in blue to emphasize that these are states we are adding on to our original NFA. The way I'll do this is I'll create a new start state with epsilon edges going to the start state of NA and to NB and call the whole thing N. And why did this work? What does, excuse me, why does this work? Well, when we start, we immediately proceed to the start state. Um, before we read in any symbols, we then take the epsilon edges, the start state of NA, and to the start state of NB. So we have three live branches at this point. Next, we read in our first symbol. And as soon as we read in our first symbol, the branch that stayed at the start state dies, and our two NFAs begin to run exactly as if we were running them both in parallel. And we know that by the rules of NFAs, if either one accepts, if after reading in all symbols, either one of NA or NB is at an accept state, the entire computation accepts. So that's our proof, much simpler than the proof using the Cartesian product and simultaneous simulation that we did with DFAs that the class of regular languages is closed under union.
that you can guess what we're going to prove next. Yep, we're going to do Claney star. <clears throat> All right, third proof. Maybe these get easier and easier. I could even assign this as an exercise. Um, perhaps there will be exercises. Maybe there'll be a very similar proof to this on the short homework for this week. Theorem, the class of regular languages is closed under star. Uh, we'll have a third proof by picture. Um, let N1 be an NFA that recognizes N1, let's do NA, that recognizes A. We'll show an NFA N that recognizes a star. In this case, we only have one building block, right? We've got NA. It is some sort of some sort of funky NFA with one or more. Well, I suppose it might have zero accept states if it doesn't accept any strings, but it may have some accept states, so we'll draw them in. Uh, and we want to recognize A star. I think A star was perhaps our most confusing, our least intuitive regular operation. So if you recall, A star is defined to be a one, a two, a three, dot, 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 a k, for some k greater than or equal to zero, and a, a string in a. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to non-deterministically guess our partition of an input string into a bunch of substrings that are in a. So to do this, we're going to draw um, epsilon arrows from each end state to the start state. Um, and we'll say one. Epsilon arrows from end states to start state. This ensures that every time a branch of computation recognizes an input string or a substring, we guess a partition of the input at that index and try to read a new substring. So what does that mean? That means if I have an input like uh, x1, x2, and x1 and x2 are both strings in my language. Uh, a bunch of computation will happen as I read x1. I'm guaranteed that at the end of x1, because it's in the language A, I'll be in some accept state, and the branch that's in that accept state will non-deterministically branch back to the beginning. If x2 is also in my computation, also in my language A, then Starting it from the start state at the beginning of X2 is guaranteed to yield an accepting computation. Likewise, 
any string that this automaton accepts uh, must be a series of strings from my language. I must have reached an accept state somehow. And if I've reached an accept state, either I've, you know, either it's the first one I've been to, or I've gone around this loop with epsilon edges several times, which means I've read in several substrings. However, there is one little thing we've missed with Clany star, uh, which is we need to handle the empty string case. If you remember, k is allowed to equal zero. So a star is always going to contain the empty string epsilon. And our current construction doesn't allow for that. So we need to make sure we accept the empty string. And we can do that by adding a little gadget that effectively checks to see you know, this will accept on the empty string because all that will happen is we'll go to the first state and then accept and an epsilon transition to the start of our NFA. So if we have more than one or at least one symbol, uh, the branch in that first state will die and we'll start off our computation as normal. So that is the construction that shows that the class of regular languages is closed under star. And that concludes our series of three proofs showing that the regulation, regular languages are closed under concatenation, union, and star. So I'll restate the punchline for you. The punchline is this. If we know that some set of languages R is regular, or I should say, contains only regular languages. So if I've given you a basket of 15 regular languages, then anything we build from R using regular expressions, sorry, regular operations, that is union, concatenation, and star is also regular. In other words, any big set of regular languages, I can build an infinite number of languages that I also know are regular because we've proved that there are procedures for generating NFAs and DFAs that accept them. So that is pretty cool. We have expanded our class and our tool set dramatically. At this point, we'll take a short break before we go on to part two. Next up, it is regular expressions. So thank you for watching. Thanks for being here, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.